in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning. Verse 1 says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife. Good morning, church. It is good to be here with you this morning looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If this is your very first time here, welcome. You picked a great week to join us. If you, if you need a Bible, you go, can go ahead and raise your hand. The ushers will get one to you. Um, I started thinking about this message about a month ago um, when, I, when I realized that I was going to be teaching on this the same day as my parents' 34th anniversary, which is exciting. And they're here, and it's 34 years today, which is great. But I also wanted to warn them and say this might be awkward. This might, this might be uh, a thing and to which they said they were going to sit right in front and we just make this thing a whole big family affair. Um, they're not sitting up at the front. They were gracious to me this morning. Uh, we, we preach through entire books of the Bible the vast majority of the time here at Community Church, and we are in this series in 1 Corinthians. Um, last week, we, and we broke this into, into like mini-series um, to make it a little bit easier for us to, to find some focus and things like that. Um, we finished our first little mini-series, which is called Come Together. Um, this morning, uh, as we start chapter 5, we start this new mini-series called Let's Talk About because we're going to be talking about some things that might not uh, be normal dinner conversation, uh, such as how to deal with uh, the type of sexual immorality that isn't even tolerated with pagans. Uh, a guy is sleeping with his father's wife. Not, I don't know about your house, but that's not normal for us to talk about um, in, in our house anyway. Um, and so let's, let's pray as we get started and, and dive on into this. Lord, we are thankful that you are a good father. God, as we sang that song, that, that you don't just give us what we want, that you give us what we need, that you will, you will have hard conversations with us when it's necessary. And so, Lord, as we engage with, with your word this morning, I pray that you would, have, you would give us sensitive hearts, that we would hear you speaking to us and your desire for us, and that we would hear we would hear your grace and your mercy in the midst of this entire conversation. Lord, help me to get out of the way and help us to see Jesus in all of his glory and all of his majesty. It's in your name we pray, amen. So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, we're going to read the first two verses here um, as this is kind of the, the summary of this entire situation. Um, I encourage you to go through and, and read this, this whole thing um, over, over the next few days. I encourage you to, to read through uh, chapter 6 and chapter 7 as well. Um, we're going to be going through those over the next few weeks. Um, and there are, again, some more of those sensitive type conversations, especially if you have smaller children or kids in middle school. Uh, you might want to have a prep conversation uh, before, you, before you come to church. Anyway, um, chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. So the big question that we're looking to answer here this morning, and really what this addresses, is how do we address sin? How do we address sin? Those things that we do that we shouldn't be doing, and those things that we don't do that we should be doing. How do we respond to sin in our own lives and the lives of people around us? And using this as a reference point will greatly inform what conclusion we come to. So here's what's happening in, in Corinth. As Paul is writing this book to this church in this city in ancient Greece, he's, he's addressing a very specific issue that's happening. There's this guy who's sleeping with his father's wife. 
Now, it's not his mother, it's his stepmother. And we might think, like, that's really weird, and it certainly is. Um, Culturally, if a man were to become a, a widower, Generally, he would marry someone younger than himself, and so it's highly probable that this, that this guy's dad had married somebody that was, it was about his age. So you have dad who's older, and then you have a girl who's like 20, 22, and then the son who's 20, 22, and there's some chemistry between the two of them. By no means does that make it okay, but it gives you a, a little bit of a background as to what exactly is going on here. It's not his mother, it's his stepmother. Still not good. Because pagans don't even tolerate that type of sexual immorality. When he uses that word pagans, he's talking about non-Jesus followers. People who aren't, they aren't even remotely close to following Jesus. And they don't even allow that type of sexual immorality to be allowed amongst themselves. And they allow a lot of sexual immorality. If you remember, when we talked about the city of Corinth, there there was this temple to the Greek goddess Aphrodite. And this uh, Corinth being a port city, there was a lot of traffic and a lot of trade and a lot of money and a lot of sailors who were on leave for a couple days. And so they would go to the temple of Aphrodite, which employed about a thousand temple prostitutes. There were about a thousand temple prostitutes, men, women, boys, girls, employed at this temple that people would frequent and they would engage in sexual relations with these temple prostitutes as a means of worshiping Aphrodite. They tolerated a lot of sexual immorality in Corinth, but even this crossed a line. This crossed a line with the, with the culture around them. This family affair was a big problem. And they were, they were at least passively accepting of this relationship. Best case scenario, they're just allowing it to exist and not dealing with it. They're, they're letting it be there, and maybe some of them are saying, you know, that's really not okay, but I'm not going to get in the middle of that. That's not my place. I'm not going not gonna to insert myself into this, this situation, and that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario is that they're proud and they celebrated this relationship. And that's what all the indicators point towards, is that they're proud and celebrating of this relationship. Paul says, he explains the situation, he says, you are arrogant. Another way to translate that is you are proud. You're proud of this. But you know what you should be doing? You should be mourning. You shouldn't be proud of this. You should be mourning. But maybe they justified it in their own head and within their community. Maybe they said things like, we have freedom in Christ, There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus himself said, judge not, because we're going to be judged. Jesus also said that if you don't forgive your brother, I won't forgive you. And so if if I don't forgive this guy, if I don't allow this guy to to be here and to to accept him, then Jesus isn't going to accept me. And this type of rhetoric, what it inevitably ends up becoming is a license to do whatever we want. Maybe they said things like that. That's speculation. We don't know for sure. But regardless, we know that this relationship was at least tolerated among them. And Paul, talking about this specific issue, says, absolutely not. You can't allow this to keep on going. You're so proud, but you should be mourning because of the destruction of this man's sin and because of the shame that you have brought on the church. You have got to deal with this sin. You've got to get this guy out of here if he's not going to separate from his partner. You are gathering. You are gathering in the name of Jesus. You're gathering in the name of Jesus as a holy people, as people representing what God is like, as God's people, and you're proud of this sinful relationship? Are you kidding me? Do you understand how messed up this is? You have got to get rid of this guy. As he says it, let him who has done this 
be removed from among you. The end of the chapter, he says, purge the evil person from among you. And we read this, and when I first read this, it's like, oh, Paul, hold on here. What? Okay, this is the problem, but calm down. Don't you think you're getting a little carried away here? And on one hand, maybe at first pass, it's kind of like, this is coming out of left field. I don't know where, what, whoa. But it, it also shows us and informs how seriously we should handle sin. And how seriously we need to handle our sin. The other thing we need to understand and realize is that we are literally reading someone else's mail. We are reading one side of an ongoing conversation. We're seeing this little snippet of this whole big conversation. And he doesn't just make this up. He's not just saying, you need to get rid of this guy and just shooting from the hip like, I think that's the right idea. No, he's pulling from the words of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus as we see in Matthew chapter 18. If you turn there, it'll be on the screen as well. Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So if, so if there's something going on, whether the person has sinned against you or you've, been, you've noticed a sin in this person's life, the first thing you're supposed to do is go and talk to them by yourself. You go and you say, hey, I see something in your life and I... I'm worried about you. I, I, I don't think that that is, is the way that we're supposed to function as followers of Jesus. And I, and I think you need to really reconsider some of the decisions that you're making. And if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If he listens and, and says, you know what, you're, I've, uh, you're totally right. You're totally and completely right. I have... I've been, I've been blind against this and I've been wrestling with this and I, I've just allowed myself, but I, you're right. You're right. I need to repent and turn and come under the authority of Jesus once again. Great. Good job. Church discipline 101. First thing you do, you go and you talk to the person by yourself. Jesus continues on. But if he does not listen... Take two, or take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So if the person says, yeah, I hear what you're saying, no. I'm just like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stop doing what it is that I'm doing or I'm not gonna start doing what you want me to do. I'm just not all about that. I don't think that what I'm doing is wrong. And so thanks for your consideration, but see you later. If that's the situation, then, according to Jesus, you take two, one or two other people and you go to that person again. So you take the volume and you turn it up a little bit to try and get this person's attention. And you take these two or three other people who are also concerned about this person and you say, hey, I'm, we're concerned about you. This isn't just me anymore. Like, there's other people involved with this and we're concerned about where you're going. We're concerned about the path that you're, you're going down here. Because sin only leads to destruction. And we're, we don't want you to, we don't want to see you in a place of destruction. So you take one or two other people with you, turn the volume up just a little bit, little bit. And if he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. Now, when he says church, let me give you an example of what he doesn't mean. He doesn't say that I go and I talk, to, I talk to my brother or sister about something's going on, and uh, they say, no, I'm not interested in doing that. So I take a couple, people, a couple other people along with me, say, hey, we're worried about you. They still say, yeah, not interested. And so then we parade them up on stage and put them right here. And then we proceed to air out all of their dirty laundry and say, this person is a total wreck. Repent, you dirty sinner. That's not what Jesus means when he says, tell it to the church. Especially in a context like this, where you might have no idea who this person is. You know what they call that? They call that slander. 
And that's not what Jesus means when he says, tell it to the church. What he, what he means is, remember who he's talking to. He's talking to his disciples, 12 people. Tell it to the church. Tell it to your closest friends. Tell it to this network of 5, 10, 15 people. Tell it to your community group. The people who know this person best, come around them and say, we are so worried about you. You turn that volume up even more. You turn the volume on that megaphone up even more and say, we are worried about you. This situation is not okay. The way that you are conducting yourself is, is inappropriate. And we are very concerned about you. And if he ref refuses to listen, even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, because we all know how we treat Gentiles and tax collectors in these parts. He means treat them as an outsider, because you've gone to this person on multiple occasions. You've talked to them. You've tried to reason with them. You've talked to them about submitting to Jesus in every part of life, and they have just been hard-hearted and said no. And so at that point, you have to start to question, is this person actually a follower of Jesus? Are they a part of the fellowship of believers? And this isn't like a three-day thing. This process takes a long time. If they won't listen to the church, you treat them as an outsider. He continues on. Matthew 18, verse 18. He says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they asked, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Have you heard that verse before? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. A lot of times we, we use that verse when, we, when we're praying for someone. Or when we, when we gather as a church. We have everybody here and we say, Jesus is among us. There's two or three that are gathered in his name and he is here in our very midst. God is that close to us. Jesus is that near to us. Or we, we're coming around a brother or sister who is going through a, a painful time, a loss of a loved one or a, a serious illness and we say, Jesus, as two or three, as we are gathered here, we know that you are here in our very midst. And I think that's totally true. I think that's totally appropriate. But it's so interesting. The, the context in which he says that is about conflict. It's about addressing sin in a brother or a sister's life. He says, if two or three are gathered in my name and you're dealing with this situation, you're coming around a brother or sister, trying to get them back on the, going in the right direction, there I am in your very midst. It's almost like Jesus thinks that addressing sin is like a, important. And I think that that's the first thing that we can, we can glean from this, the first thing that we, that we learn from, from this, this chapter in 1 Corinthians and from the words of Jesus in Matthew 18, is that there's a time and a place to address sin. There's a time and a place that we need to address sin in our own lives and in the lives of the people around us that we are closest to. And so Paul pulls from this. He pulls from the words of Jesus as he's writing to this church saying, you've got to get rid of this guy. You've got to kick him out. Purge the evil person from among you. Treat him like a Gentile or a tax collector. In verse 9, chapter 5, verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. He references a previous letter that he wrote to this church. He references a previous letter, and I think that Paul has already addressed this issue a few times. He's encouraged the church to address this issue a few times. The church has addressed this issue a few times. He's, Paul has addressed this in some subtle ways, and now it's gotten to the point where he's just got to lay down the hammer. 
He has just got to lay the smack down on this church. Because this guy has refused to repent of his sin. He's refused to say, you know, you're right, I'm wrong. And what I'm doing is wrong and inappropriate for a follower of Jesus. And so Paul tells the church to cast him out. And this is the way he says it in verse 5. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. You are to deliver this man to Satan. What does that look like? Hey, Bob, let's go. All right, Bob, Satan, Satan, Bob, y'all have fun. We'll see you later. I don't think that's quite what he means here. In fact, what he means is that you put the person, this person, outside of the protection of the church. Because the church is a place where Jesus reigns. Where this, there's this group of people who have submitted to Jesus' lordship. They're, they're, it's an outpost of heaven. And you put them outside of the protection of the church into the world, which is Satan's domain for now. And is still in rebellion against Jesus and his lordship. It's this way of saying, we're not going to talk to you about this anymore because we don't actually think that you're interested in following Jesus. So you keep on sinning, but know that it only ends in destruction. Know that if you continue down this path, it only ends in your destruction. We won't be watching your back anymore because we've tried to do that. We've tried to have your back and you've wanted nothing to do with us. And now you will have nothing to do with us. This is really harsh. This is really, really harsh. But we can't forget the second part of this verse. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Church discipline is never about destroying someone. Church discipline is never about getting even. Church discipline is about reconciliation. You put this person out into the world, into the domain of Satan, for the destruction of their flesh so that they will be saved in the day of the Lord. And then he goes on and he expands this. He says, this isn't just about this one situation. This is about a lot of different situations. This is how you're supposed to to deal with anyone who is greedy or an idolater or a violer or a drunkard or a swindler. Addressing sin in ourselves and those around us is an important part of of following Jesus. And because this is about following Jesus, is why Paul says this in, in chapter 9, or verse, verse 9, rather, sorry. Chapter 5, verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter, that previous letter, not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and the swindlers, the idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. The second thing that we learn about this is that this is a family affair. This is about addressing sin within the church. This is an in-house issue between sons and daughters of Jesus. We don't do this with people who aren't a follower of Jesus. We just don't. What does he say? For what have I to do with judging outsiders? 
Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? We do this with a brother or sister because we're watching each other's backs. We're so good at deceiving ourselves that we need to watch out for each other. But we can't take this same idea and apply it to the world at large. A pastor that I respect, his name's John Mark Comer, he's at a church in Portland. He taught on this passage and he said something that I really liked and I'm gonna share with you. He said, somewhere along the line, we decided that holding up a sandwich board on street corners was, and protesting the sins that we see in the world was a good idea. Somewhere along the lines, we thought that that was a good idea. When we read this chapter, we hear Paul say, what have I to do with judging outsiders? And so that's totally inappropriate. Don't judge those out in the world. Instead, judge those in the church. So how about you pick up your sandwich board and you go and you protest outside your brother's house who's cheating on his wife? How about that? This is an in-house issue. This is a family affair. A few weeks ago in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, we heard Paul call us all collectively a temple of God. We as a church are called to be holy. We're called to represent the things of God, to be this outpost of heaven here on earth. And we can't be holy collectively when there is obvious, flagrant sin among us. We can't just turn a blind eye or tolerate sin like that. Sin needs to be addressed. Now, this might make some of us uncomfortable. This might make the vast majority of us uncomfortable. For a couple of us, we get real excited about this. We're like, yeah, get them, boys. Don't use this as a justification to be a spiritual bully. Don't you dare use this to be a spiritual bully. Where you walk around and you're looking for stuff to point out in people's lives because it makes you feel better about yourself. Well, I see this in your life, and I see this in your life. That guy, he's got some problems. We got a church discipline, this man. Don't go looking for stuff in people's lives because all that makes you is a bully. Don't be a spiritual bully because the purpose of this, the purpose of spiritual discipline is restoration. The purpose of church discipline is restoration. The purpose of talking to people who are around us about the sin that we see in their life is so that they would be restored that they would repent and turn and follow after Jesus once again. So that's the third thing that we learn from this, is that we need to constantly, always pursue restoration and reconciliation. Paul says, deliver him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. He talks about the destruction of the flesh. He doesn't mean the destruction of his personhood. A few weeks ago, we talked about that word flesh. It's that Greek word sarx. It's that sinful human part of himself, not just the flesh and bones. So you hand this person over to Satan for the destruction of that sinful habit so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord, so that he might be brought back into the community. So how do we respond to sin? How do we as followers of Jesus respond to sin? I really, really hope that I never have to deal with a situation like this. On a number of levels, I really don't want to do that. Because this is kind of an extreme example. And the vast majority of the time, 
We're not going to kick somebody out of the church. Like I said, this is a long process. We are people of Jesus. We are people of grace and mercy and repentance. This is very rare, this type of situation that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But you remember in Matthew chapter 18, when you go to one person individually, alone, just you and them, or with two or three other people if they won't listen, maybe that thing happens a lot more than we might even realize. But we don't parade somebody up on stage, and so it's like, oh, I guess guess we don't do this. No, we do this all the time. People do this to me all the time. Hey, man, I, I see the way you're doing this, and really this is not okay. You're right. Because I want to be a part of a church that's going to come after me if I start to run away. Let me give you an example. I'm married to this wonderful woman. Her name is Anna. Let's say something stupid were to happen in my brain and I were to decide that I was going to divorce her. I would expect for some people to come knocking on my door. You don't just get to let me do that, not even just as a pastor. If I wasn't a pastor, if I was just an everyday follower of Jesus, don't let me do that. Don't let me self-destruct. We do this within the context of a community group or those people that you serve with, even within your marriage. Because we're being transformed into the image of Jesus, we're growing and becoming more like him every single day, shedding that old person, that person that we used to be, and putting on Jesus, who we are now. There's a time and a place to address sin because sin gets in the way of that process. And we know that we need to address a sin in a brother or a sister, but how do we do that? So if you're sitting here and you say, Joe, I think I'm in this place. I see something in a brother or a sister, and I, what do I do? How do I do this? A few things to consider. By no means is this all-encompassing, but I think it's helpful. Number one, pray, 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 and pray some more. Pray for humility. Pray for the words to say. Pray for a softness of heart as you enter into that conversation. Pray that your heart for restoration and reconciliation would be so obvious to this other person that you're coming at this from a place of, I care about you. Second thing, don't nitpick. Don't look for these tiny little things in everybody's life and say, hey, I see this. Hey, I see this. Hey, I see this. Don't do it. Generally speaking, don't do this with someone that you have no relationship with. If you just see somebody and you see something happening, don't come up and talk to them and say, hey, we got to talk through Matthew 18 right now because there's a thing here. And they're like, who in the heck are you? Look for patterns within a person. Watch for patterns before you have a conversation. Because let's be honest, we are human beings and we screw up all the time. I unintentionally cut people off in traffic. I do it. I'm a dirty sinner just like you. But that doesn't mean that you need to come knocking on my door, calling me out for that, because chances are that when my head hits the pillow, I am fully aware, aware of the things that I've royally screwed up today. Watch for patterns in a person, because a pattern is a problem, and then that problem needs to be addressed. But the biggest thing, if you're going to do this, if you're going to go and talk to somebody else, what you need to do is you need to pull the plank. That's what you need to do. you got to pull the plank. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So, before you do this, pull the four by four that's sticking out of your face 
before you start to deal with the speck that's in somebody else's eye. Doesn't mean that we have to be Jesus and we have to be perfect before we have a conversation about something that's going on. But it does mean that we have to make sure that we do a regular internal audit of things. Especially before we deal with anybody else's sin, we've got to deal with our own. So I'm going to invite the worship team up. They're going to lead us in a last song here. I've got a couple questions for us to think through. How do you respond to sin? Is it something that you tend towards, you accommodate, you tolerate? Or are you on the other side and you're a spiritual bully? What about in your own life? How do you deal with sin in your own life? Are you addressing the chronic sins in your own life? Are you seeing those things and seeking restoration through repentance? Or are you tolerating it and allowing it to be there? When we think about this church in Corinth and they're dealing with this situation, with this guy, sleeping with his father's wife. I don't think that this situation just came walking through the door and they said, that's a great idea. We're going to get behind that. We're going to be proud of that. Chances are this was a slippery slope of sin. That it was this one little thing that led to another little thing that led to another little thing and another little thing. And pretty soon they found themselves in this situation and they're like, I don't know how we got here. Do you have that in your life? This tiny little sin that goes this way and then another one and another one and another one. Pretty soon you're looking around and you're like, I don't know where I am and I don't know how I got here, but I don't want to be here. I would say that once you notice that sin, you need to acknowledge that that is God's grace allowing you to see that sin. That he is showing that to you and saying, this isn't how I want your life to be. I don't want you to end in destruction when you come home. We have to address sin. We just have to. I'm sure that this isn't the most inspirational and happy message that you have ever heard. It wasn't the happiest week for me either. But this is reality. We have to address sin within ourselves and within those around us. Because Jesus died to set you free from those sins. So don't be passive. Be holy as a son or, da of da or daughter of Christ. Don't go back to those shackles. Don't enslave yourself to those things because it only leads to destruction. As I've been thinking about this, and thinking about how to talk about this and how to put this whole thing together. I think I realized that what's so beautiful about this is that God doesn't just give us what we want, but he gives us what we need. That he will have those hard conversations. That he will deal with this stuff because he cares for us.